Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers, being in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. So we pray that this video serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, that it encourages you, and even challenges you and brings you closer to Jesus. So again, we're super excited that you're checking out this video and we pray that it's a help to you. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for your church, and I think the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. Mark chapter 12, uh, we come to this passage beginning in verse 38 because it's uh, harvest day here at Brainerd. It's a day we've set aside, and so if you've been a part of this study, you know we're fast-forwarding uh, a little bit, uh, skipping over some passages that, Lord willing, next week we'll come back and get back in succession. But we wanted to come to the end of Mark chapter 12 um, on this particular day because I think there's some things uh, that God would um, uh, say to us and do in our lives with regard to uh, just uh, the, the stewardship that He calls us to. And so Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 38, contains a very familiar story to many of you. I want to read this text over you. Uh, Mark is the human author, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and this is what it says. In his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. And have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. Who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now, in one sense, it may seem obvious why we would come to this passage of Scripture and uh, our observance of Harvest Day, a day that um, Brainerd Faith Family has set aside for many years now, this time of year, uh, to just give over and above our regular tithes and offerings for the work of the ministry here. As we work our way through this text, I, it, it, may, um, it may suddenly seem strange why we would come to a passage like this for a number of reasons, and I want to try to help us to understand that this morning. So let me just jump into this. I just, some, a lot of times I'll set up our big idea, uh, lead up to it. I just want to go ahead and put that on the table, and then I want to I want to show you what we're, we're going to do. I think, I think when we come to this passage of Scripture, what we're seeing is that the gospel, the gospel exposes hypocrisy and it compels believers, Christ followers, to care for those in need. So let me say it again. The gospel exposes hypocrisy. And it compels Christ followers, it compels believers to care for those in need. And I just want to go ahead and say to you, I, I think that is one of, the, one of the primary reasons we do what we do in our stewardship and, and, and why we do it the way that we do it. 
And at the end of our time together today, I want to make some applications to that, and I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you, because we're going to give you an opportunity today when you leave, uh, as you're leaving, to give toward that offering above your regular tithes and offerings, and, and I want you to do that. I want you to do that today with this in mind, because this is what the gospel compels us to. It exposes hypocrisy and it compels us to care for those in need. All right, now let's let's look at this passage of Scripture. Because I think there's oftentimes some misunderstanding about it, I I simply want to, I want to divide this in in three uh, sections. And each of these, I, I want to be an explanation an explanation of what is going on here and ultimately how that connects to what we're doing, okay? So here's the first one. The warning in this passage is about corruption. We got to get this, okay? We've got to understand that what is going on, not just here, but, but in the larger context of, verse, of chapters 11, 12, and 13 in Mark's gospel, and I'm going to show you this here in just a second, is it, it has everything to do with the corruption that had seeped in to the Jewish religious list, uh, system and perverted it. And so everything that is happening here, everything that's going on, you know, in some way is tied to this, especially when we come to verses 38 through 40 and Jesus talks about these scribes. Now the scribes were, they were part of the the Pharisaic tradition, they were Pharisees, they were also known as rabbis, Uh, they were the purveyors of the Jewish religious law. These guys were the Bible teachers, okay? They were the professors of the religion, that they were the experts in the law. And Jesus, he identifies them and he picks them out, really I think almost in a representative way, because in Matthew chapter 23, he's going to just include them with all of the Pharisees. Not all Pharisees were scribes, all scribes were Pharisees, but he's going he's to use them here really as more representative of what, what the religious leadership had become. And if you'll notice in verses 38 through 40, this section, these few verses, they began with a a stern warning when Jesus says, beware of these guys. Isn't that interesting? That tells you how corrupt the system had become. When Jesus is telling his disciples and he's telling the people, beware of your spiritual leaders. Beware of your religious teachers. Beware of your, your, your Bible experts, he's saying. It's going to start with a, a strong warning, and, and then it's going to end with a pronouncement of condemnation. So you see it in verse 38. In his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes. This is something, by the way, the, an awareness of the reality of false teaching that runs all the way through Scripture. We find it Old Testament and New Testament. Just thinking about it from a New Testament standpoint, many of you would know that Jesus in his famous Sermon on the Mount, he, he said right early in, at the beginning of his ministry and helping people understand about the kingdom, one, he said, one of the things he said is, beware of false prophets. Why? Because they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're what? They're ravenous wolves, right? The Apostle Paul, you go fast forward all the way you know, to the book of Acts, toward the end of it, he's finishing his ministry, he's leaving Ephesus, and he, he exhorts the Ephesian elders in, a, in, in Acts chapter 20, and what does he tell them? He says, when I depart, when I leave, there are going to be ravenous wolves, false teachers that rise up in your midst seeking to take you out, basically. And those are, just, those are just two examples of the emphasis all the way through. You get over into the pastoral epistles, so much of it is about false teaching and the warning and the caution of, uh, about that. Because watch this now, come in here real close. This is, what, this is what the Jewish religious system had become. It had become corrupted, it had become perverted by false teachers. And these scribes were at the top of the list. Now, 
If you do have a finger, a piece of paper over in Matthew chapter 23, let me just go back there. Let me just tell you that Matthew 23 is an expansion on these verses right here. Matthew gives us a whole lot more information than Mark does. So here's what it says in Matthew chapter 23, he said to the crowds and to his disciples, so he's not just talking to his disciples, and he says this, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. They sit in the place of respect and honor. And then this is the first thing he tells them. So do and observe what they tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach, but they don't practice. They tie up, and, and, and please pay attention to this. It's going to become really important. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with the finger. All right? They do all their deeds to be seen by others. They make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love the places of honor and the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, the greetings in the marketplaces, and they like being called rabbi. They like the title, all right? They like being called master. But notice what he says. But you're not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. Call no man your father on earth. You know why he's saying that? Because it's wrong to call your dad father? No, because the scribes wanted to be called father. History tells us that that was one of the titles that they pursued because they wanted to be seen as the givers of life, the one who gave people the life of God, and they desired that and they pursued it. So Jesus is basically just correcting that right now and saying, don't do that, and certainly don't do it if you're in one of those positions. Don't call anybody father, he says. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, which is the Christ, the greatest among you. And this is where Jesus ties it in to what we've seen in Mark's gospel already. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And then right there, we're not going to read it all. But you can just skim it, the rest of chapter 23, and one of the things you'll find is a repeated warning or or a pronouncement of judgment seven times, beginning in verse 13, he's going to say, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So he, he puts them together, the religious leaders, he calls them hypocrites, which by the way, is not a reference in the New Testament to a Christian who is acting like an unbeliever. It is a reference to an unbeliever who's acting like a Christian. And that's really, really important because Jesus is going to make it really clear that these guys are not the real deal. They don't know God. They're not going to heaven. They're lost as a goose. That's part of his point. Look in verse 13. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who enter in to go in, or or who, who would enter to go. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, but when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell. Do you see that? Of hell as yourselves. It's, 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 it's very, very clear here that Jesus is saying, these guys don't know God, and they're not leading you to know God. Look at verse 27 in Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. He's saying you have the appearance on the outside of being the real deal, but on the inside you're not. These these individuals were not men who had relationships with God. They wanted to put on airs about that, but they were leading others to the same destination. Listen, the same destination that they were headed for themselves, and that is separation from God in all of eternity. This is why back home here at the ranch in Mark chapter 12, Jesus is going to say at the end of verse 40, they will receive the greater condemnation. Now, there's a couple of things there important for us to acknowledge. One, 
And that is that just like there are degrees of rewards in heaven, there's apparently going to be degrees of punishment in hell. The worst of which is far, far more than anyone would ever want to experience in all of eternity. But he says these guys are going to get the top tier. Why? Because there's an accountability. There is a responsibility for those who are put in positions of leadership to shepherd God's people. James would say the same thing later on about the church. And, you know, in James chapter 3, verse 1, he says, let not many of you be teachers. Why? Because there's, there's a higher standard. There's a greater accountability. There is a stricter judgment, he says, for those who are in positions of leadership. And so what's Jesus doing here in Mark 12? He's, he's identifying one manifestation of of the corrupt nature of the Jewish religious system. And so, look at what he says about these, these, uh, you know, these guys. He says, you know, number one, they, they love prestige. They walk around in long robes. Now, the Old Testament law commanded the Jews to wear robes with tassels on the bottom as an indication of their obedience to the commandments of God. But guess what the rabbis did? They, they wanted to wear longer ones. So they made theirs longer, i.e. the long robes, because they wanted, to, they wanted to be looked at as those who they really kept the commandments of God and the laws of God. They also like greetings in the marketplaces. There, there, there's, you know, one, one uh, report that, not more than one, that would indicate that when it was customary that when a rabbi walked into the marketplace that the shop owners were supposed to stand up. And as Matthew's gospel said, they, 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 they sought certain titles. They wanted to be called rabbi. They wanted to be called father. They wanted to be called instructor. They, they were after the prestige that went along with that kind of recognition, not just prestige, but position. Notice verse 39. They want the best seats in the synagogues. In the, and, and, and the places of honor at feasts. You know, in the synagogues, most people, the common people, sat on the floor. But the leaders sat on benches on the side or up at the front. These guys desired that. They pursued it. They wanted to make sure there was a distinction. When there was a banquet and a feast, they wanted to be at the head table with the, you know, with the, with the host or the other guests of honor. That was the position that they felt like they, they needed to be in. And then verse 40, they weren't just after prestige and position, but they were after profit. And this becomes really important. Notice in verse 40, who devour widows' houses. The word devour in the language of the New Testament basically means to eat up, to consume. And it's, a, it's, it's somewhat of a, a, a vicious, violent term. And, and, and Jesus uses here to describe what these guys would do to a segment of society. Listen, a segment of society that all the way through Scripture God had said, these folks have a special place in my heart. Let me just, I, I've actually kept this. I wrote it down a number of years ago in the back of my Bible just because it was a very pointed lesson for me when I was studying another passage of Scripture. Let me just give you some examples of some of the things Scripture says about God's perspective on widows. Just listen to this. Exodus 22, he says he hears their cry and that the people are not to mistreat them. Same thing in Zechariah 7.10. In Deuteronomy 10, he administers justice for them. In Psalm 68, he defends them. Psalm 146, he relieves them. Psalm 15, he establishes them. And then in his Isaiah chapter 1, he tells his people to plead their cause. Jeremiah 22, he tells his people to do them no wrong. 1 Timothy chapter 5, let's come over into the New Testament. He tells his people to honor them. James chapter 1 verse 27, he tells his people to visit them. Listen, widows have a special place in the heart of God. Church, let's understand that. This is God's value. So this is part of the scripture. This was part of the Old Testament law. Now think about that in terms of what's happening here. 
One of the roles that the rabbis played, that the scribes played, is they, you know, they, they weren't just teachers of the Scripture, but they basically were incredibly important influencers in the social life of the people. They, they made legal decisions. They counseled people with regard to their, 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 their finances and their money. Now, now, now think about that in terms of this. What were these guys doing? Well, they were doing things like giving widows counsel about their finances and then charging them for their services and even holding their possessions in, you know, in, 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 in check as, 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 as earnest for that. They, 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 they would consume them. They would take them into their own possession. That's what these guys were doing to the very people that God said, widows have a very, very special place in my heart, and I want you to take care of them. This is what these guys were doing to the widows. They were after profit, which, by the way, has probably been the primary characteristic and motive of false teachers throughout history and still is today. Still is today. And it's not hard to recognize that reality. This is what they were doing. They were in it for profit. And then they were in it for pretense. My English translation even says it for a pretense in verse 40. They would make long prayers. Just kind of picture them kind of looking up in their prayers to see who's watching because that's that's what they wanted. They wanted people to hear them pray and to watch them pray and to think that they were especially pious individuals. And they did it all for a pretense. They did it all for a show. Now, you can read Matthew 23, and you can see this expanded on all the way through there. And the judgment that is pronounced, the condemnation is rendered toward them. God is very, very serious. But what I want you to see is this is what, this is what the Jewish religious system had become in this particular day. So, in Mark chapter 1, the warning is about corruption. Now, let's talk about this widow And let me tell you this and run the risk here of messing with tradition a little bit. The widow, I think, is about the casualties of that system. The widow is about the casualties. Now, I know when we come to the story of the widow's might, the widow's gift, and this may be one of the biggest motivations, it would seem, for coming to a text like this on a day like this that we're setting aside to give a particular offering. But I think we need to lean into this just a bit in light of what we've just said, in light of what Jesus has just said. And what I, what I want you to see in this passage of Scripture, while, while this woman certainly could be considered an example of sacrificial giving, I I don't think that that is the primary purpose of Jesus telling this story or calling attention to her in this particular place. Why? Well, first of all, let me just show you the game, the game that's going on. In verse 41, he sat down opposite the treasury. This would have taken place in the court of women in the temple because it was the place that not only men could go, but women could go. They weren't allowed in every place there. So this is where they set up the collection of the offerings. There were 13 boxes or uh, shofar trumpet-shaped receptacles, you know, with a narrow end at the top and a wider end at the bottom that people would drop their monies in. Now, all of these uh, 13 receptacles, uh, by and large, had different purposes. On them would be the the reason or the name or the particular box that you dropped certain kinds of offerings and, and gifts in. And so there were a number of different ones for about seven of them, but then there were six of the 13 that were just free will offerings. And interestingly, the free will offerings were go to go to build and maintain the physical temple as well as to provide for burnt offerings, which interestingly the high priest benefited from. Really important to keep that in mind. And when you put this in context, 
you put it in context of chapters 11, 12, and 13, and you put it in context of what exactly we just read about the scribes and Pharisees, we have to understand that what was going on, although prescribed by Old Testament law, had become corrupted, it had become perverted. We've already noted that. Just go back, you know, back, go back to where we were last Sunday in the triumphal entry as it's commonly known and, and you remember what, uh, you know, what is going on here. Jesus ends, uh, or that passage ends in verse 11 with Jesus going into the temple and looking around at everything. And one of the things I told you last week that he was doing was he was casing the joint. He was, he was doing reconnaissance for what was about to happen. And what was about to happen? Well, just kind of look ahead. Starting in verse 12, he's going to curse a fig tree. In the middle, he's going to cleanse the temple and come back on the other side and explain the withered fig tree that he had cursed, all of which are representing, listen to me, his judgment, his judgment on the Jewish religious system, the icon of which was this temple. It had become everything. It had, it, 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 it had become something that was far more than it was ever intended to be. And what is Jesus going to do in verse 15? He comes in Jerusalem. He goes into the temple. He drives out those who, look at this, sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. We'll come back and explain this next week. But I just want you to get the general idea. And he wouldn't allow anyone to carry anything, any merchandise through the temple. He is cleaning house. Why? Because of the corruption. Because of what it had become. And he's pronouncing judgment on there. Jesus is going to have some conversations, do some teaching. And, you know, in in, in the, 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 the ensuing stories are there. And then we come to this place right here. We come to, to this judgment of the scribes and their, 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 uh, their, their, their role, their, their corruption and their perversion of their roles. And then you've got this situation of Jesus who's, who's looking and watching people coming in to the temple to give their offerings. And by the way, just look on the other side of it. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. He came out of the temple. One of his disciples said, look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. You get the idea? I mean, you got this whole context here that is about the perversion of how people were approaching this temple. If you've still got a finger in Matthew 23, let me read this. In one of the pronouncements of judgment, woe to you blind guides. This is verse 16 of Matthew 23. Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears, this is interesting, by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. Where did they put the emphasis even to the point of backing up oaths on the gold in the temple and not just the temple? You blind fools, he says. For which is greater, the gold of the temple that is made the gold, or, or that which has made the gold sacred? Verse 18, you say, if anyone swears by the altar in the temple, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, he says. What, what, what's he doing? What's he condemning the scribes for? Well, he's condemning them because their part of a corrupt system in which, listen to me, in which they benefited financially by, 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 by making the temple in the eyes of the people something that it was never intended to be, including, come in here real close, including their motives for giving to these offerings. Do you know what? This system had become, it had become a system of feeding a works righteousness which was characteristic of the Pharisees. They would teach the people that if they wanted God's blessing, see if this sounds familiar by the way, see if this sounds relevant, see if this sounds contemporary. If they wanted God's blessing, then they needed to give to these offerings. If they wanted eternal life, they needed to give to these offerings. This is what was hanging over the edge. The, the offerings weren't a problem. 
They were commanded in the Old Testament, but the teaching, the false teaching that now guided the people in what they did had become perverted and corrupted, and listen, it had become a means by which the spiritual leaders lived in wealth at the expense of the disadvantaged. This was the game going on. This is what was happening here. So you see the game, Jesus, uh, Mark uh, calls attention to the giving. Many rich people in verse 41 in Mark 12 put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Copper coins, these would have been the, the smallest denomination in circulation, the currency in circulation. Mark translates it for his uh, his. Uh, 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 Gentile leader, uh, uh, readers and to, into this what's translated penny. Let me just, just kind of fast forward and tell you the math basically of what this woman gave. It would have been 1 64th of a denarius. You know that term from uh, the New Testament. And a denarius basically would have been the average wage, daily wage of somebody that worked in a vineyard, you know, a day laborer. So the amount basically here is one sixty-fourth of an average day's wage for a typical labor, just a very, very small amount. So Jesus observes this. He observes the, the wealthy coming, giving, and then he observes this woman. You see the game, you see the gifts that are given. But that brings us to what I'm simply going to call the grief. And this is where, beloved, listen to me, I, you know, I want you to know that there certainly is differences of interpretations of what's going on here, but, but I've tried to set this up and explain the context to you in such a way that when you come to this place right here, that you see that at least there's a strong possibility that we may have misinterpreted this passage of Scripture. Because... We have a tendency to come to this place and see this woman as a model. Jesus saying, you need to be like the woman. I think the context may tell us differently. I think he may be more expressing regret. He may be more expressing lament. He may be expressing more grief. Why? Because this woman is a casualty of a corrupt Jewish religious system. Notice what Jesus says. I say to you, this poor widow's put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of the poverty has put in everything that she has had. Now, it's easy for us to understand why we would see this as a model that Jesus may be holding up, saying, you know, the scribes, they're after it for themselves and selfishness, but here's somebody who's giving and, and, and giving sacrificially. That's why I said it's easy to see why this is an illustration of that. But I want you to think about it in its context. You know, typically we, you know, we say things like, you know, well, it's, it's, the, the emphasis here is the amount and not as much the amount she gave, but the amount that was kept the, the, the rich people gave, and they, they still had a lot to keep. This woman gave, and she didn't have anything to keep, you know, and so we, 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 you know, we, we contrast it that way. The other one is we talk about attitude. You know, we come to this passage, and we say, well, you see, this woman, she loves God. She loves God, and so she's given. She's acting in faith, and, and she's given out of a sincere heart. But you understand the text doesn't say any of those things. Those are things we read in and we assume. But I want you to make another assumption given the context of what is going on here. In fact, I I think it's emphasized, and this is really interesting to me. Look at the end of verse 44. You know, Jesus could have made that point about her giving sacrificially just by stopping with, she's put in everything she had, but then he says, he he restates it and he underscores it and he emphasizes, it puts emphasis on, look, All she had to live on. Now let me ask you to just go back and connect that to verse 40. 
they devour widows' houses. What just happened? Somebody who's going to benefit lucratively from the offerings that are being put in, including hers. An offering that, by the way, somewhere down the road is probably going to resource Judas with 30 pieces of silver to betray the Christ. What has just happened? Well, this woman, as a victim of this system, has put in her last dime, and she's going to go home and die. She has nothing else. Now, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that with regard to the rich people that are giving here. Jesus actually doesn't condemn them. He doesn't say it was wrong for them to give, you know, this abundance out of their wealth. But he does indicate this. When he makes this contrast that says she's given more, let me get you to think about it this way. She's given up more than they've given up. Because you understand the corrupt religious system didn't cost the rich anything. But the corrupt religious system preyed on the disadvantaged, preyed on people like widows, and it cost them everything that they had. Now, let me just carry it you know, a step further and tell you, you know, if, we, if, if we're honest about how we typically approach this passage of Scripture, you know what the lesson is? The lesson is, unless you give every dime you have to this offering today, or you give to God, or you give to the church, unless you give every dime you have, then your, your offering's not acceptable to God. That's normally where we would come out. But I want you to think about it this way. Let's just say, and I don't know, maybe it's true, but just as an example, hypothetically, in here this morning, there's a widow. Struggles every day trying to make ends meet, a widow present this morning that has $500 to her name, and tomorrow her house payments due. In our Christian stewardship, none of us would ever think saying to that widow today, you need to put that $500 in that box back there. We would never think. It would actually be contrary to the rest of biblical teaching in Christian stewardship which says that, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat, and it's the church's responsibility to care. Even in Acts, when they were selling their possessions and bringing that, that that doesn't indicate they they sold everything. Barnabas in chapter 4, who would have been there in chapter 2, and Acts still had a plot of land in chapter 4. That's not Christian stewardship. Yes, it's Christian stewardship to give sacrificially. It's Christian stewardship that we, we shouldn't live in an overabundance where we're spending all our money on comfort and ease and to satisfy ourselves, all of those things, regular giving, things we talk about all the time, giving through the local church, all of those things are part of Christian stewardship. But it's not part of Christian stewardship that we would say to a widow who only had $500 left and a house payment's due the next day, you're not going to please God unless you put that money in the box. But yet that's the lesson we would have to come to if we see Jesus holding this woman up as a model. Now, what's he doing? He's holding her up as an example of a casualty, of a corrupt system that has manipulated disadvantaged people to the point that it is, it is prosperous and beneficial for some, but it's devastating. It's devastating for those who are in need, those who are disadvantaged. There's so much more that I'd like to show you here, but time doesn't permit. I think the warning here is about the corruption. I think the widow here is about the casualties. But let me give you one more charge, and then I want us to worship the Lord through song and through our giving. And that is that the way forward is about the cross. The way forward is about the cross. Where do we draw that from in this text? Well, we draw it from this text in its context. 
Jesus has been moving toward the cross during this whole scene. The judgment, listen, his judgment on the corrupt religious system is in view of what he is about to do. Let me, let me read you Matthew's account of Jesus' lament somewhere in this same time. In chapter 23 at the end, this is what Jesus prays. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, listen to this carefully, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What is Jesus doing? He's saying the same thing that Luke records over there in his account of Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. He said, the time of your visitation, the time of Messiah coming has arrived and you missed it. You missed it and you have made the religion that was intended to lead you to an anticipation, an expectation, and a recognition of God's Messiah. You have turned it into something that benefits those who are prosperous and exploits those who are needy. This is all in light of what he's about to do. When he goes to the cross, it is the driving force but behind his judgment. But it's also, listen to me, church, come in here real close. It is the driving force behind his, our redemption of what is going on right here. You say, what do you mean? Well, let me just, let me just give you three applications from the fact that the context here is Jesus' movement toward the cross that have implications for our sacrificial giving. Some of you may be thinking, why in the world are we studying this passage if it really doesn't teach that this woman is an example of sacrificial giving? Here's why. The cross compels us to our ministry of the word. You, you, you want to know as, why as a pastor, it, it, I don't have any reservations about challenging people to give sacrificially. Because I don't believe we're doing what these scribes are doing. Perverting the truth of God's word. Undermining integrity. Pursuing personal gain. You, you and I get to be a part of a church like this and churches where the word of God is expounded. Different contexts, different venues from the pulpit in small groups. And in that, we pursue truth together. We want to hear from God. We get to do that. We get to come into places like this, knowing that this kind of thing is happening not just on television, in prosperity gospel message, but it's happening in churches all over this city. The perversion of the truth. And people are being deceived and needy people are being exploited, and they're being told, give this money in faith, and, and, and you'll be blessed, and God will like you, and, 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 and you'll, you, you, you'll do a lot better. And you and I aren't doing that. We're pursuing truth through the proclamation of the word. The cross compels us to pursue that. Secondly, the cross compels us to the ministry to widows and all that they represent. That, that, that's what the gospel compels us to. That's what the cross compels us to. I, I hope, I hope, and, and, and I was back there. I was kind of seeing them sideways, so I haven't seen the video, but I think on that video there were some representations of the kinds of places that your money goes to that, that are, are, are ministries that have to do for, with caring for people. And, and, and protecting those who have a tendency to be exploited. You have programs. You have ministries in place. You have personnel that, that, that you ask to, to lead you, to help lead you in doing that. doesn't mean our system is perfect. We've got our scars and we've got our things that, that we need to fix. But in comparison to this system, we get to be a part of a system that says we're going to prioritize those things. We're going to prioritize caring for the needy. And then finally, 
the cross compels us to our mission to the world. A lot of those things, hopefully everything in some way we do, is resourcing the reason we're on the planet, and that is to get this gospel, this message of the cross, to every person on the planet. That's why we do missions videos. That's why we send people. That's why we give up our best. That's why we, we give uh, some of our funds directly to missions efforts to get this gospel to the nation. You understand, all of that is because of the cross. And all of that stands in opposition to what this system had become. Let me, let me pray for us, and then I want to give you a challenge and an invitation. Lord, thank you for being honest with us in Scripture. Thank you for pointing out to us things we need to be on guard against. Thank you also, Lord, that though we recognize we are far from perfect in our system and organization and certainly in our own lives, that you have given us great grace to be a part of a people that can give together and serve together and, and be confident that the money's being used in the right places. Help us with that today, Lord. We pray on this occasion, we pray that, God, our giving is over and above what we normally give would resource those things and that through them you would keep us focused on that which honors you and what, that which is near to your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me give you these instructions. We're going to end our service a little bit different than we normally do in light of Harvest Day. Our musical worship leaders are coming and we, we're going to stand and sing in a moment. But instead of sending you out after that with Psalm 62, uh, 67, excuse me, when we get through singing in a moment, Molly's going to dismiss you to exit and as you exit... Uh, that box is in the back directly in front of me, behind you. That box is not for your regular tithes and offerings. Those receptacles are in their regular places out there. But, but this is a place for us um, to, to give over and above those things driven by the gospel and driven by God's grace in our lives to guard against the things that are there, to, to be able to give confidently and joyfully. And so when Molly dismisses you, I want to encourage you to, to go. And if you came prepared to give to the harvest offering today, as you leave, just drop it in that box back there. Nobody's going to be sitting back there on the staff watching you drop uh, your monies in the boxes. <laughs> That's uh, obviously not the application, but it's there for us to worship the Lord as we leave together. So let me ask you to stand and let's honor him in these ways. Uh,